introduce y'all to Greg O'Quinn, a friend of mine, and an incredible entrepreneur. He doesn't need an introduction, but he's going to tell us some great things tonight mm -hmm. about creating a vision for your company and the strategy to get there. Let's welcome Greg O'Quinn. Uh, it's inter it, some of what I'm saying, you may leave here saying that was a little weird, and it probably is, but I, I believe all this stuff, so that's all. I can't, I'm from Alexandria. I actually, I'm married to Hope Ewing, met her in eighth grade at Brame Junior High, and we've been married uh, July 1st, 47 years. Um, we're, thank you. <laughs> it, it is weird. Um, Scott Wallace is building a house for me right now. So, how many, everybody know? Uh, anyway, I have a lot of good friends. I'm surprised at who came. I didn't think my people that know me already would come, but you're, you're here, so. Um, I went to Bolton High School, went to Northwestern, graduated in accounting, and went to New Orleans to work for, uh, at that time it was Pete Marwick and Mitchell, now it's KPMG. And I passed the CPA exam, and, um, <coughs> said I wanted to go to law school at night. Loyola had a night school. And they told me I couldn't do it. You're in public accounting. It's too hard. You can't do it. So I did it. And I went to law school. And then I came to Alexandria as a CPA, passed the bar exam. I was going to be a lawyer, interviewed with a bunch of law firms. And then I said, I really don't want to do that. And much to my parents' dismay and my friends' dismay and a lot of people, went into something called financial planning back in 1978. And um, the rest of the story is, uh, so it really started with nothing in a business that there weren't people all, all over the place doing this. As of uh, Bart Smokey's son, Brian is here with you. Brian will attest to this, tell him that I'm telling the truth. As of this date, in this little office with six employees, we now have one billion dollars invested. Now, you know, you read about billionaires all the time, and it's still a number that's hard for me to understand because you say, oh, we have a hundred people that are clients that have a million dollars invested. No, that's only a hundred million dollars. Well, no, you have 200 people, but it's only 200 million. We have a billion dollars in Alexandria in this little office. And I think that's why Gary wanted me to talk because he wanted me to emphasize that um, you can do well in this town. And particularly with technology the way it is today, you can be in Alexandria and be anywhere. Uh, Scott's about to learn that I live five months a year in Colorado. How can I do that? My office has been telling me for 19 years, you can't do this. It's called a cell phone and an iPad. That's how you do it. Um, <laughs> So you're going to see that my view of the world is a little different than most, or many, not most. And I'm going to put something over here. This is, I, put, I gave this to clients a couple of years ago, and it's called abundance. And it's kind of, um, I've never seen anything like the way it is today. I think there's more opportunities right now than ever. I wish I was a little younger. But um, anyway, I'll put it over there. You can take it, read it at your leisure. But, the const so I came back and started in the, uh, got in the financial planning business. For some weird reason, I have kept this phone book. It's a 1978 phone book. I moved here in August of 78. And I've had it in a drawer. And every year when it's time cleaning out drawers, I just never threw it away. And the point I want to make with this phone book is the constant in the 41 years that I've been here is change. And if you're not, if you don't like change, you unfortunate but I think it's an opportunity change is an opportunity let me show you an extreme example of that um, this this 1978 this one one page right here just this page not over here just that one or a list of all the attorneys in Alexandria okay the thing that's unique about this telephone book Robert you will remember this not too many others in here but you and me will remember is there was no advertising. Attorneys could not advertise, okay? Shortly thereafter, they could. Now, let me tell you who I graduated from law school with. I was in night school, he was in day school. Talk about taking an opportunity. 
or change. It's a guy named Morris Bart. Any of you heard of him? <laughs> yeah. So he takes, he graduates same time, May 1978. You cannot advertise. And no telling what he spends on advertising now. The other thing that's interesting about this, this um, phone book, and you're welcome to look through it, it really is like a history book of Alexandria, because you're looking through here. Okay, here we go, Alexandria Cleaners and Laundry. Or you can go through here and you can see so many businesses. The Colonial Restaurant. Anybody know what the Colonial Restaurant is today? Yeah, we're gonna walk. So it's a um, Plantation Manor. You know what the Plantation, here, plantation Manor, you know what Plantation Manor is today? Gold, Gold Law Firm. So it's, a, um, it's interesting, most of them aren't here. Now, that doesn't mean they were good or bad or whatever, it's just change. But take a look at that, it's, I think it's fascinating. But, and that's the constant, change, uh, and that's the thing that I, I look back in our business, and if, we were, if I were doing what I tried to do you know, that many years ago, I wouldn't be here. The, um, for example, in 1978, Walmart was just getting going. Walmart was moving through small town America, in the South particularly, and wiping out everyone. Um, I have a, a client who is a, a school teacher in Leesville. He started buying $100 of Walmart stock a month back then. He retired at 55 from teaching school, but he has two and a half million dollars of Walmart stock. His dividends from Walmart are more than his retirement. Um, what other things? Newspapers started to disappear. I remember, you know, the town talk used to come in the afternoons. Anybody remember that? And, but the credit cards, when we were in college, they were pay us to get a credit card. They just didn't exist. Um, student loans hardly existed. The other things have changed for the years. Think about, how would you like to be a taxi driver or own a taxi medallion in New York that you paid a million dollars for? And then Uber comes along. And what did Uber do that was so smart? That's what, uh, they, every Uber car that I've been in, the first comment I always make is, golly, this car's so clean. It's a clean car, uh, they speak English, they, would you like a, a bottle of water? I mean, nothing magic in their sports. There were no instant replays back, when, back then. Uh, I remember getting glasses back in 78. You went to your optometrist, they checked your eyes, and you bought the glasses there, except for Pearl Vision. I think that was the only one that, other place you could get glasses. Now you can go on the internet with Warby Parker and get glasses. So. Uh, I remember getting the first fax machine in our office. That was a big deal. And the fax were on rolls of paper, not on single sheets. Uh, of course, we didn't have any computers, didn't have cell phones. Uh, then Amazon's coming along, look what it's doing to the retail businesses, bookstores. Uh, except for some bookstores are really prospering. There's one up in Edwards, Colorado, where I live, that is booming. They just had their 20th anniversary. But they started something like, a, they have a concierge service where they find out what you, they know that I like to fish, so they said, there's a, foot, a book about um, this theft in, in England, about the feather theft, and they stole all this stuff for fly fishing. But they'll make recommendations, or if you'll sign up with us, we'll send you a book every month that we guarantee you're gonna enjoy. So they've developed their own business, but the cars have changed, uh, um, going to college online now, the drones didn't exist. I remember, my, I lived at 1710 Pierce Drive, and I remember as a kid waiting for weeks for something to be delivered, whether it was from Sears. I remember my favorite baseball team was the Los Angeles Dodgers, and I'd gotten ordered pictures of uh, all the Los Angeles Dodgers, Sandy Koufax, Don Dresdale, um, Mari Wells, all the guys, and weeks and weeks. And today, if kids don't get it the next day, it's like, where is it? Um, of course, medicine. Businesses like Kodak, they were so big, they invented the cell um, cam uh, camera. They were making so much money off the film business, they blew it off, and now they're bankrupt. Of course, Radio Shack's no longer here, Sears is no longer here. So the constant is change, and you either change or, and that's the, um, 
In 19, I came here in 78. In 1979, I was introduced to something called goal setting, which I guess that's a, you know, maybe that's the term you used before we used vision now. And I really didn't believe in it, but they convinced me if you would write this stuff down. And, and so I started doing it. I started doing it in a, uh, I've got a lot of stuff up here. Wait a second. One of the uh, books is where I, I, um, I write it at the beginning of the year, you write all this stuff down, and then you, I do it quarterly and all that kind of things. Well, for me, and I don't know if it was a fluke or what, but I did it. They, they said, do it, and you'll be surprised at what happens. And, and I was having fun with it. Uh, so uh, at that time, 1978, made $25,000. And I said, go, I want to make $100,000. That was crazy enough that you know, it ain't going to happen. Guess what? I made $100,000. And so it became kind of a game in a way. Um, and a lot, and I realized that a lot of things that, that if you kind of thought it could happen, it could happen. And um, that's not. I'm not going to emphasize. You know, I'm not trying to put some pie in the sky here. The rest of the speech is going to be about some real stuff. But, um, but some of the things. Robert Radcliffe and I were involved in something 25 years ago in this September. We were involved in something that at the time was controversial. We saw something that. Um, people didn't think could happen. And it was the, we were involved on the Rapids Regional Medical Center and a transaction that resulted in the, in the Rapids Foundation. Now, we had a vision of what the Rapids Foundation could be. I'm not sure if we believed it or not, but we did. That transaction in 1994 was $134 million. The Rapids Foundation uh, got that money and owned half the hospital today. And the anniversary is September of this year, will be 25 years. There's over $300 million in that foundation. They've done grants and projects in central Louisiana, over $150 million. And um, it's been, it's amazing, an example of a vision and, and the end of it. Um, one of, the other thing that I did back then that kind of changed my life was um, uh, they told me that in addition to goal setting, you need to get out of Alexandria. You need to see what's going on in the rest of the world. And so I, I made it a point of traveling. And, and that has changed things for me in that you, you get a chance to see what else is happening in the world. And every time I travel somewhere, I always pick up an idea. And that's, I think everybody in this room, we're all in the idea business. And what, if it can relate to your business or your life, um, and I've now, I just got back Saturday night, I took two 12-year-olds to Iceland. It was the 72nd country I've been to, and um, prettiest country I've ever been to. So, but we came, and I had, and I, uh, unfortunately or unfortunately, I make my kids do all this stuff to these grandkids, made them write down <laughs> what they saw, and goals, and all that kind of stuff. But, um, so. 1979, I started the goal setting deal, but the thing that really changed it for me, and I think this is hope where you'll get some stuff out of this, this talk. In uh, 1998, I had read a book by a guy named Dan Sullivan, and it, was, um, and it was really about, he wrote it about how technology was gonna change things, and, just, and, and it has, and I believed it. But he, he has something called Strategic Coach, and you, uh, it's in Chicago, it's every 90 days, and so I signed up for it, to go to Strategic Coach. You go there for one day, you're in a room with other entrepreneurs, it's not a financial planning kind of guys, it's, we had architects in there, and we had a landscape architect one time, we had writers, we had doctors, all kinds of business people in the same room, so everybody in that room was looking for ideas. And Dan Sullivan introduced us to things that, some of it was so simple, but it changed my life at that time, and it changed it so that so much that three years later I quit going to strategic coach. But then I started up five years later, and I'll finish that story. But in that class, and it was about vision and strategy. A lot of it was about the strategy on how you how you get to it. One of them, because everybody in this room was wound up, they were entrepreneurs, 
they couldn't delegate anything. And he convinced us that, um, he said, everyone has a unique ability. And probably your unique ability is not going to the post office in the morning and getting the mail. Or, and he can give you a list of things that probably many of you in this room do. And it's not your best thing you could do in your profession. So learn to delegate. That is a very difficult thing to do. And you can't, you can't leap into it, so you, he taught us how to do it gradually. And when I tell you today, um, I am, don't take this too offensively, I delegate everything but meeting face to face with a client and sex. The, um, I mean, I, the kids laugh at me because I hired a guy, he would come two days a week to the house. What does he do? He does whatever. What do you mean? Well, uh, change light bulbs. He gets all changed in the car. He, whatever it is to do, and I don't do anything anymore. I, it's horrible, but it changed my life. Okay. The, um, the other thing that they taught in this class was the best investment, one of the best investments is hiring somebody. And I started hiring some people um, as coaches to do, and I, this one guy I have in Atlanta, his name is Tim O'Rourke. I call him almost every day. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? Um, another thing um, that it, they, this guy that taught the class, he's, a, he's big on starting your day right. He believes starting it, uh, if you start it in gratitude, in other words, what are you grateful for? And I, take, I always take it to an extreme, and this is my third book, so it's called a man, and in it, I write down each day three things that I'm grateful for. Now, what happens is you start out saying, oh, I'm grateful for my health, or I'm grateful for peace, or you're grateful for your family, or great. But as time goes by, you get more grateful for smaller things and smaller things. And if you start your day in gratitude, the rest of the day has a different, you view the world differently. They taught that. They, uh, Rob, where's Rob? There he is. Okay, one of the big concepts right now that they're, that they're focused on is a self-managed company. How do you get your company so that it manages itself? I would guess most of the people in this room are good with ideas. And so, anyway, if you can, if you can get out of a lot of the day-to-day -day things, you can maybe be more creative with the idea end of it. They preached, whatever you're going to do, whatever business you're in, be present. In other words, don't be on the cell phone. Don't be looking across the room to see who else is here that you want. You know, be there. Be interested and not interesting. Um, I always, when I come back from those, I, I, my idea when I go to them is come back with one idea. Um, they talk about living, making your future bigger than your past. Um, what matters? They also introduced me to something that, don't try this, is all I'll say. Anybody meditate? Okay, okay. All it does, I think, is it kind of erases your brain for a second for let's say 15, 20 minutes. Don't, and I, this is a book, and I, the, um, a guy that has a hedge fund, I can't think of his name right now, it might be, Ray Dalio, you ever, he has just a jillion dollars that he manages. He said, he started doing it you know, 30, 40 years ago, changed his life. He says, uh, you meditate, it makes you more creative, makes you just, so, but this book is called Strength and Stillness by a guy named Bob Roth. And it's, a, it's simpler than some of these books about, I mean, it is not trying to focus on this and focus on that. It's talking about just sit there, close your eyes, and just kind of be calm for a while. Don't try to, don't make it more complicated than it is. And um, again, you're just resting your brain. We don't get a ch chance to rest our brains anymore. We're, you get up, you've got text, you've got emails, you've got all this stuff. So, Try. Um, 
another. Um, he introduced me to a book called Abundance by a guy named Peter Diamatis. I now get his um, emails. And um, he, this guy views the world from 30,000 feet. And he, like, in, for example, in Africa, on a daily basis, 250,000 people are coming out of poverty. I didn't know that. You would think Africa is just in. We, it talks about what's going on in this country. And it's um, why the United States has done so well. I mean, think about our, I, was, I went to Israel this spring. And in Israel, we went up and we were at the Lebanon border where they've got guys with guns there. We got over Syria where we went through with this guy in a Jeep in the Golden Heights. We're driving along there, landmines all over the place. And the guys with guns up there. And you go over to Jordan. We have two oceans and borders with people that we're not fighting or going to fight with. So we don't have to protect our borders from, from a military perspective. We have the most we have more navigable waterways in this country than the rest of the world combined. Now, you go back about 100 years and take navigable waterways, all of a sudden you could get goods to places that you're, you were so much more competitive than the next guy, and it's still the cheapest way to send stuff. But take a look at this. These are some of his ideas, but it's a view of the world that's a little different than we're used to hearing. Um, okay. Another big deal it taught me to do was sleep. Uh, and the other thing, it, two more things, and then we'll get on to the best idea I've got. Um, they introduced some things called, one of them is called strategic circle, and it's a, one of these deals where you, uh, you take what, okay, here it is. A problem that you're working on, what's the problem? You know, and what are the obstacles? And you kind of work your way through it. And then, it, um, so it's a, it's taught, it taught me how to approach problems and how to address them. And uh, the last one was a concept they call who, not how. Everybody, in, how many of you have things in your life right now that you've been thinking about for years, you just hadn't gotten around to doing it? Anybody? How about the novel you're going to write, the this you're going to, all these things you're going to do, and you just don't have time to do it, or you don't take the time. Okay, let's go find somebody else to help us, a who, and say, I called a friend, friend and uh, I've been, I had this idea for a book I wanted to write, and so I called him and I said, Bill, I know you don't, you're not doing anything. All he does is, I mean, he does nothing. <laughs> But I know he can write. And I said, I want you, you'll be the co author. We're going to do this thing together. Hell, he's now, I've got, I've got the work, I've got the outline, I've got the story, and he's writing it. So, but take a project and let somebody else. In other words, it's effectively delegating. Okay. Now, um, I love living in Alexandria because my kids can play. Now it's my grandkids. They can play soccer. They can play baseball. They can play football. They can be in, play music because it's, everything's five minutes away. My brother-in-law's in Baton Rouge. Their daughter is in junior high. She's in the plays. It's 45 minutes to get her there. Well, you're not going to drive back home, so you stay there. They finally, just, just recently, in the last two months, they moved so they could be closer to some of the things. You live in Baton Rouge, your kids can't do all the stuff. Um, so it's an easier place to live. The, um, but in Alexandria, so when I moved back here, people were telling me all the things I couldn't do. Um, I'm telling you, we've built a billion dollar business here. We've, um, a couple of years ago, Gary knows about this, when I was, I'm, I'll be 68 next month. Um, I was 55 or 56. And I'd been saying all these years, all these things, one of the things I was gonna do, I wanted to run a marathon. And so my wife and daughter got sick of hearing about it. And so they entered me in the New York Marathon. The New York Marathon is a lottery. You, you enter it, and they either draw your name or not. And they put their names in it too, and they're runners. I'm the only one who got picked. So it's May, it's May of 19, uh, 2007, yeah, 2007. They said, okay, what are you gonna do? Well, I could run a mile. 
So I went and bought a book, How to Run a Marathon. <laughs> and I ran the New York Marathon in November 2007. A marathon is probably the best example of vision and strategy that I can think of because unless, unless there's a physical problem, um, you can run a marathon. You say, no, I can't. I don't run. You go out and you start by walking around the block. Then the next thing you know, three weeks later, you're running two miles. And it's, it's little by little by little. And isn't that how most things in our life, if we just don't bite off too much and don't get injured doing something stupid and eat right, and then you get up to the New York Marathon and there are 50,000 people running this thing. And it's, uh, you all, we all think, oh, you have to be a good runner. No, these are not good runners. I mean, Oprah Winfrey ran a marathon. She ran the Chicago Marathon. She was, and I was kind of like, if she can run a marathon, I can run a marathon. <laughs> and she actually did pretty good. But um, one of the most embarrassing things, I, I, I've run now 10 marathons. I'm running 11 when next year. But I mean, I was in the 26 mile, everybody's obviously too tired and all that. But I've seen people who were crippled past me. I mean, I had a lady, I know she'd had a stroke. She was running like this. And I could not, she passed me. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't make myself go. But my point is, um, okay, impossible is an opinion. Okay, if you, impossible is an opinion. Now, I'm gonna tell you something that's crazy. At the strategic coach meeting, when I, the year I turned 60, it was in August class, and he introduced a concept called 10 times. If you, probably some of you have heard of this in some other contexts. And the idea was, let's think in terms of increasing something, whatever it is in our life, by 10. The amount of money you make, the amount of time you take off, the number of times you go skiing, the number of times, whatever it is, by 10. And it doesn't have to be one thing, it can be a bunch of things. And I came back from the, and his, think, his thinking was, if you are a linear thinker, your time, let's just take your business for a second. Let's increase our business by 10. And you say, that's impossible, I can't do it. I said, okay, uh, Scott, first year you were in business, how much did you do? And you tell me, I did this much. And it was probably you know, 20 years ago or so. Have you passed that number by 10? Well, yeah. How'd you do it? You just did it over time. So you've already, you've already increased your business by 10 times and you're telling me now you can't do this. You've done. Suppose you started thinking about increasing something by 10. Now you can't increase it by 10 by saying I'm gonna increase our sales by 5% next year or because it takes forever to get there. But if you started thinking of different ways of, to think about your business, maybe you can. So I came home from the class and I told Hope, I said, you know, I'm one of the older guys in the class now. They introduced a concept called 10 times. Uh, that's probably, and the classes actually ran from November, February, May, and August. So that was the last class of the year. You had to re-up if you were gonna, and I said, I think I'm gonna quit because they introduced a concept called 10 times. There's no way I can do something, increase it by 10. And so that was gonna be the end of it. I, went to the class, I always go to the class on Thursdays, so I came home on Friday. Saturday morning at one o'clock, I woke up. Wired. Pulled out a yellow sheet of paper and started writing down 10 times ideas. Now, it was crazy stuff. But um, And I said, okay, this is kind of crazy. But started writing, wrote them all down and I signed up again. Okay, that was, eight, it'll be eight years ago this August. And this point was, suppose you don't, suppose you're a failure at this. You don't increase it by 10, you increase it by three or four. We're talking about, I'm not talking about three or 4%, I'm talking about if your business was making 100,000 and you increased it by three, you're making 300,000 or four. As of this date, my income is up 4.9 times through, and it's because I changed the thinking on it. Okay, Bart, listen, I mean, Brian, listen to this. One of the things that I did was, I said, I've been in a business where traditionally 
people go sell something and you get paid a commission to do it. So that means that if I call somebody up, they probably are saying, what is he selling now? Okay. So I decided to change it from charging a commission to I'm going to charge a fee. And we can buy and sell as much as you want or as little, or, but there is no, here's what the fee is going to be. Changed my life. Okay, here's some of the other things that I did that were, it, it, when you look at them one by one, it, you might say, well, that ain't going to increase your business by 10. But took the thing, one of them was, I knew in my business that if I talked to so many people or clients a day, certain things were going to happen. So I just set up a process that every day, here's what I'm, I'm going to do this, and I do it every day. Um, another one that I did was, and I said, 100% of my business comes from referrals. So I'm going to try something new. When I see people, I'm going to say, and I have it printed out on a desk in our office, and it says, I really appreciate your business. I don't know if you know it or not, but all of our business comes from referrals from clients like yourself. And if you have a friend, relative, somebody you work with who could use our services, please give them my name. Now, what did I just say that was offensive? Yet in my business, very few people will say that. My business increased dramatically. The, um, I'm not going to go through all of these. But um, started delegating more, um, preaching abundance, um, doing what I call more due diligence. By that, due diligence is get out of town and go see something different, get an idea. Uh, we built a new office, changed, our, changed things dramatically. We, uh, I started doing this. This is, another, this is kind of crazy, but um, I quit shaking hands. I started hugging, <laughs> and it, uh, the first time, though, I don't think I've hugged you, Robert, but <laughs> you're harder to hug, than, <laughs> but I will. The first time, there, but it, it changes the whole nature of the business. It's a, um, I've, um, the other thing I've done, okay, this is, some, this is something, this is a little crazy, okay. The Stan Sullivan guy wrote a book. Some of you will love this. It's called My Plan for Living to 156. That is crazy. You're not going to live to 156. But here's what his point was. And this is, I'll try to, all of you think, think to yourselves, what age do you think you're going to live to? And we all have an age. We say, well, my parents lived to this. or So you've got an age, pretty much. And their ages range from 50 to 100. Is that the number you agree with, or would you like to be more than that? And everybody's going to say, I'd like it to be, if I'm in good health, I want it to be more. Okay. Um, he says that mindsets encourage you to live. The biggest uh, impact is committing yourself to a longer lifespan, is changing the way you're living presently. So if you say, okay, if I could live longer, let's say if I could live 10 more years from this, what would you do? What is it in your life that you, and what happens is the profound the effect it has on it is, now that doesn't mean you can't get cancer and all that kind of stuff, but you start living today as if you're going, in other words, one of the, I'll give you an example. One of the things that I'm, one of my big deal is really think that if kids have a talent or a skill, and I have a, golly, wherever my cell phone is, I have a seven-year-old who can weld. So he's, he's got it made. Uh, so if you have a skill or an education, you probably, and you can stay off drugs, you're probably gonna do well. So I started giving scholarships. I started giving them to Alexander Senior High, I support Louisiana College. Why? Because I want Louisiana College. It's here. It needs to succeed. But I started giving scholarships. And I, uh, so I went to Alexander Senior High because my kids went there. And I said, I want to give these scholarships. This year we gave two, uh, one to LSUA and one to Northwestern. I went to Northwestern. 
And they said, what's the criteria? I said, good kid. That's all we're looking for. And started giving away. And I've done this for like 15 or 20 years. But based on this guy's deal, my goal is, and this is a crazy ass goal, is to have $100 million in a foundation giving scholarships to kids in Rapids Parish. You have to live in Rapids Parish to get scholarship. Now, Claiborne Deming did this up in El Dorado, Arkansas. Claiborne's from Alexandria. Uh, Murphy Oil's there. They started giving scholarships, about $5 million a year in scholarships to kids in El Dorado. What if they went out of state? What if they did this? What if they, he didn't care. What happened? The unintended consequence was people started moving to El Dorado. Businesses started come, moving to El Dorado. Why? Kids get to go to college free. Well, now, will I hit 100 million? If I live long enough, I will. But, um, so, but if you change the mindset of, okay, and I can do the numbers, if I put this much aside and do this and it does this, have to live to 156, I could have $100 million. But if I found, you know, a couple other people to do it, but it's, what it does is it changes what you do, it changes what you're doing. And it's, you say, and so every one of my friends that I grew up with are retired. And they, I mean, I went to, we went to the um, World War II Museum in New Orleans. We were in a car with six of my friends that I grew up with. I said, I'm the only one in the car that works. And they said, well, you're the only one that likes what you do. So, uh, but, but the mindset is they are essentially waiting to die. So if you can change that mindset into I've, I'm working on these projects, he says you can extend your life. So I know Robert and I have talked about Robert loves what he does. Correct me if I'm wrong, he is not going to retire, and neither am I. So, but he, he's uh, got projects out there that are going to take a while to get done. So it's going to make him live longer. And if we're lucky, we will. But that's one of the 10 times things. The, um, the other, one of the others in this 10 times is not letting yourself become a commodity. It, once you're a commodity, you're dead because somebody is always cheaper. So if you can, if you can prevent that from happening by making yourself, uh, um, I, I have something that I, that I call, I'll show it to you. Called more than money. Any, have you ever heard me use that term? Um, I said that almost every day in our office we do something that has nothing to do with the investment world. My, um, my college roommate is a guy that um, grew up in Natchitoches. He wanted to be an actor or a writer and his parents encouraged him not to. You will never make it. You're not gonna make a living doing that. It's so difficult. And so you need to go to law school. So he went to Tulane Law School. The day he graduated from Tulane Law School, he went to New York to be an actor. And for 10 years, he struggled. And they were kind of like, we told you so. You know, you could be a lawyer. So he had a tragedy in his family, and he wrote about it. So he has written Steel Magnolias. He's written about 15 movies, TV shows. Um, so he calls me up the other day. He's a client. He says, I really need your help. My daddy's in a nursing home, and uh, he needs to see a cardiologist, but I, I He's really not in condition. I can take him from Alexander back to Natchitoches. Can you get him in to see a cardiologist? Now, here's a guy who I've called him on the phone, and he says, Greg, you mind if I put you on hold? I'm on the phone with Dustin Hoffman. Or I'm on the phone with Julian. And so he's, he can touch all these places, but he can't get a doctor. Yeah. Called Robin Friedman. He was like, I can't believe he did that. Well, we all do stuff every day in our lives. And so I had a rock made up. It's called more than money. And that's kind of what uh, I'm trying to do in our business. We, we, we get paid to do this, but we're trying to do something. Help the kid get a scholarship. Help somebody get a job. Help, but more than money. So that's part of the 10 times ideas. Um, 
You see. So my point is, you're not thinking of your business in terms of increasing it by that much. You're trying to think of ideas that can change either the way you're perceived and, and ideas in that business. Okay. The, um, I still do that gold book. I still write those things down and, and I break it up into 30, 60, and 90 day things that I'm trying to... And, the thing that I tell people when they're doing that is, if you don't get it, don't make a big deal. Just move it forward. Um, I've looked at my career, and we can all look back on what we've done. I look back at what I was doing in the 1980s, what I made money from, what I was looking at the 1990s and 2000. And I can guarantee you it's changing. My profession will change again. And that's what I'm looking for what that next thing is. I, I kind of know what it is, but um, I'm in the process right now of doing something um, that in our business is something you really don't want to do. And we're going to change our broker dealer. And the reason we're going to change is the, our broker dealer is in our business when you're selling mutual funds or stocks or stuff, you have somebody bigger than you who they're the ones that make you follow the rules. They have compliance and they make you follow the rules. They also, if you made a mistake, they're bigger than you, so they're responsible for your mistakes. And all the trades go through them. Our broker dealer sold out to a hedge fund. And the hedge fund has already said, they don't put it in these words, but we're going to flip it, meaning they're going to sell it in three years. Well, that's kind of like the banks coming into Alexandria and saying things are going to be so buying out a Bernier Bank, a Rapids Bank, and saying things are going to be better now, right? And they've already started cutting the services. So we're going to change broker-dealers. Now, so I tried to take this 10 times concept to this problem and started talking to broker-dealers. And finally found one that looked at our business differently and offered to help us do it, but it changed my whole mindset on ways we could profit from it. So again, um, you just I'm talking about thinking different. Another thing I did, we built a building a couple of years ago. I went to our current broker dealer and I said, I want you to help us build this building. And they said, we don't do that. That's your building. I said, well, we do a lot of business with you. So I was wondering if you would give us $500,000 for the building. And they said, they didn't say no. Okay? Now, I shouldn't have asked, but I did ask. They said, well, let's think about it. So before the week was out, they contacted me and they said, what if you do this level of business for the next six years, We'll pay you the $500,000. We'll pay it $80,000 a year, or is $85,000. They did it. Now, how many of you are in a situation right now in your lives that, well, I don't know if I should call him or not. I don't know. What can they say? No. Has anybody heard that before? <laughs> but so think of it a little different is what I'm trying to say. Uh, the other thing and I'll finish it up, is look, if you're looking, if you're setting those visions out there and trying to get there, look, of them, look at them in, in intervals. In other words, I kind of for myself said, okay, from 61 to 71, here's the kind of things I want to be doing. From 71 to 81, here's the things I want to be doing. From 81, I'm with Robert on this one, 81 to 91, I'll be doing this. And, um, so it always gives you something that you're working toward. And also, at a certain level in your business, it's the little numbers that make a difference. Now, here's what example I'm going to give. In our business, when you're, um, somebody, your broker-dealer has the money, they charge you a fee. Okay? In our fee-based accounts, they charge a fee of 0. 0.0055. And if I take that percentage and I go apply it to this account or that account, you look at the numbers and you say, no big deal, no problem. Okay. Well, the, one of the other companies I'm talking to, they said, well, our fee is going to be 0 0.003. So 
So, well, it's no big deal. Wait for but go take it on a billion dollars or $500 million that are under, all of a sudden, the savings, we didn't have to get, they didn't have to pay us anymore, just the savings was $150,000 to $200,000. So all of a sudden, at some point in your businesses, the little numbers become the big numbers or can become big numbers. I've heard stories about Walmart changing the wax they use on the floor and save $26 million or some crazy stuff. So in your own businesses, start looking at that. Um, okay. My, I showed you the phone book. Hopefully, when you're looking forward 41 years, you're still going to be in the phone book, and hopefully I will be too. And the, um, but I can guarantee you, if you're not changing or changing the way you're thinking, you probably won't be. The, uh, I did, so, this is crazy, okay. I had a guy in New York that I, I met, and he, he's in the jewelry business. So I called him the other day to tell him happy birthday. And I said, well, how's it going? He said, well, I'm really eh, not so good. I'm 55 years old. I said, shit, 55. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, you don't have a problem. <laughs> See, I've been doing this for 30 years. I said, well, and this guy makes jewelry for people in places. Like, you'll see somebody that has their jewelry line. Well, he probably makes it. I said, well, I got an idea for you. I just read an article in Forbes magazine on Serena Williams. And I'm just infatuated that the brand that she has created is so much more valuable than her playing tennis. It's incredible. And, and who I hate and who I admire more, probably anybody in the world, are the Kardashians, because they are absolute marketing geniuses. I mean, come on. But getting back to Serena Williams, and I said, what you need to do, she's got a clothing line, she's got this, you need to design a jewelry line for her. And here's what he said. This was, it was a crazy idea. He said, you know, I'm personal friends with her manager. That's a great idea. So, I'm telling you, uh, it's never a better time. The internet has changed things for the good and bad, but people have access to you, you have access to people, you have access to ideas, and you can be in Alexandria today and do business. I have clients in 28 states. The fact that I'm here or in Colorado. So, um, change. Uh, to be 156, and um, that's it. Gary, any other idea? <laughs> any other? Good. <laughs> yeah. Any so, questions? You mentioned dance. Sullivan. 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 Yeah. Dance Sullivan. Yeah. What are authors you read currently? Okay. Um, and how often do you I read every day. Um, I read stuff on the internet. I look, I look at the Wall Street Journal. I, I don't read it from cover to cover, but I'm just looking for ideas. Um, uh, my problem, one of my faults is I read too many books at one time. And, you know, I'm constantly getting another book. And, um, like, there's a book that this guy, um, Ray Dalio, wrote. I don't know if y'all have seen that. Let's see, we may have it here. Anyway, this is a book. I brought this one along. This is really good. It's simple. It's called, Where Will You Be Five Years From Today? Okay? That's the name of it? That's the name of it. And I bought it at a gift store here in Alexandria. And it says, this is your one and only life. Starting today, you can make the next five years the most exciting, productive, amazing years of your life. And they go into stuff about how to do it. And it's really a matter of deciding you're going to do it. Okay. It is by, let's see, who is it by? I swear to God, I don't see it. Wait a second. Doesn't have an author, but I'm, I don't know. Google it. I, I don't see it. Really don't. I see it might be here. I do not see that. But it's really... I'm all, I'm, Gary, what am I reading now? 
I'm reading The Feather Th Thief. I'm reading, uh, oh, this book, Abundance, I'd recommend that as a, uh, something to read. I've read that a number of times. Um, there's, a, there's a book, let me think of the name of it. And it's about why America is the way we are. Golly, I can't think of the name of it right now. I'm reading that. And it, well, that's another one that's good. Uh, let's see. But it's about, it goes back into our history and why we are the way we are in America. Um, is that uh, one that's like the 2,000 year lead? Something like that, yeah. Um, so that's all I can think of that I'm reading, but I, I got a whole stack of them next to the bed. Any other questions? Or, yeah, P Patrick? Uh, just, just, just a thought. I'm sitting here just kind of we'll put this over here. talking about some things of interest. And I think the, the, the biggest thing kind of coming away that you and I have in common with riding around with your, your friends who are old and <laughs> don't work and it's not that they work. The point is, people say, well, why are you still working? I said, well, I never started working. I don't work. I do what I love. And it was old Jesuit priest told me one time, I was asking him, I said, you know, I, I get up at 4.30, 5 o'clock in a white heat about going to do what I do. And I'm not trying to make money. It's just I'm so excited about it. I'm doing something wrong. Okay. And he looked up and he got this book and he opened it up and he said, son, he said, what you have is called vocation. And he read the definition. He said, a vocation is where a person's talent and happiness collide with a need of the world. One of the, what you're yeah. happy about and what your talent at makes the world a better place. You never work a day in your life. It's amazing. One of the things that kids are always asking me, what should I major in, what, and, I, and our parents, what should my kids major in, and I tell them it really doesn't matter, they're not going to do it anyway. <laughs> because, and there's a lot of truth to that. Because you really, you don't know what you're going to do, and I look at myself as a perfect example. I didn't, I know your, your father told me one time, you made, I made a big mistake, <laughs> not going into public accounting, but you know, I see. I feel sorry for doctors sometimes because they get into medicine, they um, they get into it, they can't get out of it once they're in. Because what are they going to go to? And they've got a mortgage and kids and all this stuff, and they can't get out. We just had our 50th high school reunion, and the, the girl that was the valedictorian spoke, and she was amazing. She was so smart, and she went to Baylor, and she was in going to she was in pre med, and she said, and nobody ever knew what happened to her, and she said. I had so much pressure on me in high school, I had so much pressure on me, and I was sitting in some lab my sophomore year, and I looked out the window, it was spring, and kids were out there doing stuff, and I said, this is not what I want to do. And she went into education, and she got her, she went on, she's now getting her PhD, but she became a high school English teacher and had a wonderful career but it wasn't what was expected of her. And that's a lot of kids get into something that people, well, you're so smart or you're so talented, we expect this of you. So, and in and, and the world we're in today, it's gonna change so much anyway, because if you get trained in something, it's probably not gonna be the way it turns out. I really think a liberal arts education with a business minor or something like that can be a, a great background to do stuff today's environment. Yes, hey. <laughs> Mind talking just a little bit more about delegating. How do you let go? Okay. You have to buy one thing at a time. In other words, look at something in your life that you're doing and you say, this is not my best use of my time and I'll use going to the post office and start with that and say, okay, I'm not going to the post office anymore. Here's, what, here, here's an idea, something I did. I found myself, I'd get up in the morning, I'd turn the TV on, I would spend an hour watching TV and it's always the same thing. And I said, okay, I'm limiting myself to 15 minutes and I'm turning it off. But the same way with the delegating, pick something little. It's like we were talking a while ago about diets and stuff. You can't go on a diet and say, I'm going to do this. You have to start with something real little. 
delegate something so simple, I'm not going to do that anymore. And, you do. and then you go to the next thing. And I'm not joking when I tell you I've delegated my life. Uh, and I, what's happened, Rob and I were talking about this. When I, in year 2000, I bought this house in Colorado. I started going out there. What happened when I'm there all day long? People, Greg, can you do this? Can you do this? So when I told them in 2000, I said, I'm leaving in June, and I'm not coming back till LSU has its first football game. Ha, 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 you can't do that. I said, no, I am. You can't do it. So I went. All of a sudden, they started doing stuff that they were supposed to be doing anyway. <laughs> and I wasn't there to do it. When are you coming back? <coughs> we have a new uh, lady at the office at the reception. She said, uh, you're going to Colorado tomorrow? I said, yeah. I said, when are you coming back? You're going to be gone a week? I said, no. Come back in September. Scott, I'm going. <laughs> uh, no, really, when are you coming back? But you, you have to jump off into the deep water, and you do it. Nobody is going to do it as good as you. They're not. And you're just going to have to say, I'm using that time more effectively. And um, it is, there's a, one of my guys in my class was a, um, he had an, an he didn't have a construction company. He had an air conditioning repair company in Nashville, Tennessee. He had 150 something trucks. And they, all he did was repair heating and cooling. They didn't know new construction. <coughs> and he was going crazy. Because he had to, I mean, he had to see the trucks come. I mean, he had, had to touch it all. But he, out of this class, he came up with some ideas. And he finally started letting loose us some things. And one of the things he came up with was, we're not ever going to send anybody a bill anymore. So how can you do that? How? It's called a credit card. You go to the house, you fix the air condition, put it on their credit card, and you walk away. He has no accounts receivable anymore. And he started delegating some of this. It's just little. It's, but think about what, are, you know, what do you make money at or what are you best at and try to focus on that. Wes? Yeah? What is your life purpose? What is your life purpose? How do you realize? The, um, the best, most of my, most of my clients are, um, I call them blue collar billionaires. They worked for Procter & Gamble. They worked for Exxon. They worked for Chevron Offshore. They worked at Clico. They worked somewhere and they retire, and uh, they're going to get, and they're typical. Here's, here's the profile. They have a house. It's almost paid for. They have a pickup truck. They probably fish. They, their kids are grown, um, and they're retired. My purpose is for that person to come back, like I have somebody come in the morning at, at 930, and I know what he's going to say. He's going to say, Greg, I've been with you for 22 years. And I've been living out of this account here for 22 years, plus my Social Security, and I have more money than I started with. My purpose is to give that family financial peace. Because we all have enough problems in our life with there are so many things that can go wrong. So if I can help with that part of it. Now, that's from a business perspective. And so that in a personal, of course, we all, you know, it's our family and our grandchildren and our, I'm a, um, I'm a believer in experiences. Uh, my kids, I go to my grandkids right now and say, what did you get for Christmas? I don't think they can tell you what they got for Christmas. But they can tell you, I took, I've, I've decided, I've taken all my Social Security money. I haven't touched a Social Security check yet. It all goes into an account. And I told my kids, uh, plan a trip and we'll take a family the government, the government is going to pay for our vacation. And we've taken two trips now. We went on an Alaskan cruise, and we went, on a, we went on a trip up to Maine. If you ask those kids what they got for Christmas, they can't tell you. But if you ask them the names of the waiters on that cruise, they know it. Kids remember experiences. They don't remember things. So one of, the, one of my big deals in my life 
And I just took two to Iceland, and I took one on a road trip out west of the Grand Canyon, and is experiences, something that they will remember when they're old, and uh, as opposed to things. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You you also mentioned uh, when you were speaking earlier about uh, Alexander and your love for uh, Rapides Parish. Uh, through your many different experiences that you just stated, uh, what is your uh, I guess you say five year vision for the city of Alexander, Central Louisiana? Okay. The um, here's what I here's what I tell people particularly like Chamber of Commerce and that kind of thing. We, you're, you're not selling our assets. Here's what I think is good, that, that would be easy to sell. Do all of you agree that our, um, particularly our high schools are pretty, are okay? Everybody say our high schools are okay? I think they are. I think we have pretty good high schools. Some better than others, but pretty good high schools, okay? Let's go to your friends in Baton Rouge in Shreveport, in Monroe, in New Orleans, and ask them the same question. Are your high schools pretty good? No, they're not. So here we have decent schools here. If you moved, if you were coming to Alexandria, your kids are probably going to go to Tioga, to Pineville, to Peabody, to Bolton, to Ash, go to a high school. What is the savings to you as a family for having your kids in public schools? So that's an asset, okay? What else have we got? When we, going back 40 years ago, I remember we used to say, if we had an interstate, remember this, Robert? If we had an interstate, if we had four-lane highways crossing through Alexandria, if we had a port, the list went on like that, we, now we've, now Alexandria's gonna make it. Well, guess what? We have it all. And it's still, I'm not very optimistic about Alexandria right now because I don't, I don't see anything. I think the growth for Alexandria has to come from within and not from without. In other words, we've got to have the businesses that are here to go to Crest Industries, to go to Roy Martin, to go to people that are here and I'll take our business. Our little old business, it's bigger than it should be in Alexandria and say, okay, what are you doing in that business? What can you do to grow Crest Industries or Radcliffe Construction or something so that that's where the growth can take um, as opposed to somebody moving in here and just, there's not another Procter & Gamble that's going to move to Alexandria. It ain't going to happen. So we've got to take what we've got and grow it, I think. Um, and the other thing that you sell on, this, on living here is the lifestyle. We have got great churches. We're surrounded by national and state parks. I had a guy come to me one time. He moved here from Nashville. I said, why did you move here? He said, oh, I'm with the Forest Service, and I love to bicycle. We, I looked at the map. You're surrounded by places to go biking. I never thought about that as an asset for Alexandria. But um, So take what we've got. If you like to fish, if you like to hunt, if you like to boat, if you like to be five minutes from baseball practice, sell what we've got. Um, so I do think we have problems, that, but I think we can do something about it. I like Jeff Hall. I supported him for mayor. Uh, he's a client. Uh, I'm optimistic. So, Anybody else? Questions? Gary? Thank you, Greg. Okay, good. Was this what you wanted? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.